Okay, so last year I talked a little bit about um, fixing bugs or finding and fixing bugs using Coxinal. This year I'm going to talk about uh, automating evolutions. So what we're interested in is the context of um, legacy software, like the case of Linux. It has existed for around 20 years, I guess. Um, over time, people have uh, the developers' priorities change. So maybe in the beginning of Linux, maybe performance everywhere or, s or small size or small memory usage were absolute priorities. Um, now we realize that maybe some parts of machines are faster, some parts of the code are not so critical, and so we can maybe have a better design instead of em emphasizing performance everywhere. Um, so as time changes, also just people in general figure out better ways of doing things, new patterns appear, and so you want to um, somehow write the code in a more modern way. Okay, so we're not talking about necessarily adding new functionalities, although there might be new functionalities involved. The, the idea is just new APIs, how can we do things better? So some simple examples that I'm going to consider in this talk, one of them is the use of Booleans. Okay, so this has absolutely no effect on performance, it just makes your code look nicer. Um, so uh, for many years people used one and zero for Boolean. When I started studying computer science, that was presented as something that was sort of clever, look, zero is false, one is true. We're just using bits, we don't have any funny data structures. Um, but if you have a value which is, is only being used as some kind of flag, it's much more understandable, immediately understandable if it says true instead of one and zero, because one and zero are used for other things. Uh, so a more complicated example is the idea of managed memory. Okay, so in general, the kernel often has to allocate memory. You say kmalloc, you saw, uh, allocate other kinds of resources as well. You allocate clocks, you allocate uh, IRQs, and so on. Um, and all of the allocating all of these resources requires freeing them after a while, because the kernel runs for a long time. Many things we don't need for all of that time, and we want to get rid of things so that we can allocate more things later. Um, in one particular case where these freeing things is needed is when errors occur. So if you plug in some device and it doesn't work, you don't want to keep around all of its resources that it tried to accumulate uh, for until the end of time. You would like to get rid of them immediately. Um, but if you look at the code, there's often problems in this kind of error handling code and cleaning up things. Um, and so a solution to the doing this is just to get rid of the need to clean up things explicitly at all. Okay, so this is something that we might associate with languages like Java that provide garbage collection. The kernel is written in C, there is no garbage collection. Um, but there's ways that you can organize your code to so that you can hide the need for most developers to have to think about the problem. Um, so at one point around 2007, I think people introduced a number of functions that start with the letters dev m mostly. Um, and these are for devices when they need to allocate memory, often they allocate memory and other resources in when they're initialization, and then they keep it during the entire lifetime of the device, and then it gets freed when the device is removed. Um, so the, the initialization and the removal are things that hook into higher interface, higher level um, interfaces of the kernel. And so we can, what we can do is we can hide the need to do the freeing in those more generic interfaces and not have to have them in every specific device driver, for example. Um, so the problem, so the issues with these changes, these changes, they require, in general, pervasive scattered modifications. So Booleans, you can think you, they're useful all over the kernel. Um, these devm functions, they're useful in many kinds of device drivers. Um, another issue is that even though they make the code look nicer, nothing actually forces the developer to make these changes. So kmalloc is still there, kfree is still there, you can still use them. Nothing forces you to use the dev m functions until you submit a patch and somebody says, well, couldn't you really use the dev m functions instead of these kmalloc from kfree? Um, and the problem is that if these changes take a certain amount of time to take off, then developers of new code, they're going to look at old code, they're going to see um, how do other people do these things, and they're going to see kmalloc and kfree, they're not going to see the dev m functions, and they're not going to realize that they should be doing things in this more modern way. So the problem is we new things get introduced and people, as people are not using them, people continue somehow to not use them. So we have some numbers here. Um, this is for Booleans. So I just picked some random point in time about six years ago um, to start. 
And we have three lines here. One is, um, this one in the middle is the number of Boolean typed variables. So this is somehow our potential for using Boolean values. And the green line is how many values, how many of these variables are actually interacting with Boolean values. And this one, this line down here is how many of these variables are actually interacting with ones and zeros. So the person has taken the time to declare the variable as being a Boolean, but the value is, uh, is still getting assigned to our one and zero. Um, so as we can see in some sense it's pretty good. We have quite a lot of Boolean values being associated with Boolean. We have an increasing number of Boolean variables, increasing number of Boolean values, um, but we still have these persistent uh, problems here and the number of them is slightly increasing. Um, so we don't have a situation where everybody who's making new code is doing it in the right way. So we can also look at percentages. Um, again, up to, at one point, up to 15% of Boolean values, variables, Boolean declared variables were interacting with ones and zeros. Now more and more of them are interacting with true and false, but we're still at five or 6%. So things are improving, but it's not perfect. It'd be nice to get rid of the problem once and for all. Uh, so here's a concrete example. This is quite a small function. Here we have a, um, basically the, the point of this function is to search for something and we want to return true or false depending on whether or not we found it. So there's a Boolean variable here. It's being initialized to zero because we haven't found it yet. Then we have our loop, we have our test in here and we initialize the variable to one now if we find it and then we return it in the end. Okay, so this is quite a simple example. Obviously, many functions that use Booleans are much more bigger and more complicated than this one. Um, so, so it would be, to fix this, it's just a simple matter. You find the Boolean variable, and um, in this case in particular, it's quite simple. We have the word bool here. We have the word zero here, so that's not good. So you could find that using grep. Um, this case is a bit more complicated because here we have RV, and there's nothing about RV that suggests that it should be a Boolean. So we have to know something about how the code is organized. Once we find it, of course, then the change is fairly simple to make, but time consuming and sort of boring. Okay, so this is for the devm functions. Um, so devm functions can only be used in certain kinds of drivers where the support libraries are set up so that they, the, to do the automatic freeing afterwards. So I've looked at two kinds of drivers, platform drivers and I2C drivers. And I've only looked at the use of one kind of devm function, which is um, devm kzalloc, which is the basic memory allocation function. Um, there's a whole host of others, but they have sort of changed over time, so I thought it'd be most fair to look at this one. Um, and what we can see is um, here, uh, the dotted lines are the kmallocs, the old way of doing things, and the solid lines are the devm functions, the new way of doing things. And um, what we see is way back here in probably about 2008. Uh, it was possible for the platform drivers to use these dev devm functions. A few people were using them, but it really, over a number of years here, took off extremely slowly. And then, um, so I didn't study this in, in great detail to understand the cause and effect, um, but for some reason, at some point, people started using them and it started taking off more and more. And in particular, you notice that here, here we have the removals perhaps of um, the old way of doing things. And here we see that the line of the new way of doing things is going up higher. So that suggests that both old code is being uh, modernized and new code is, being, is using the new API. So once the new developers see the ways that other people are doing things, then they can do them in the more modern way. Um, yeah, so actually in this talk, I'm not going to talk about introducing, automatically introducing the, net, the use of devm, kzalloc and devm, um, and the other devm functions. Uh, so that can be done, but it's a bit more complicated than I want to go into in this period of time. Um, so what we're going to look at instead is a evolution that has occurred in the use of these devm functions. Um, so this is function devm io remap resource. And this function has a bit of a complicated name. It's actually a merge of several other functions. So it actually does three things. It takes a, it gets a resource as an argument and the resource is often collected, uh, obtained using this function. It takes the resource as the argument. It checks whether the resource is valid. 
um, and then it reserves the resource using, um, uh, it's not written here anymore, uh, DevM request mem region, and then it uh, maps the resource using DevM IO remap. So it takes <laughs> an extremely common pattern and turns it into just one function call. We still have the um, platform get resource for obtaining the resource. Um, but the issue is that, that we're going to try to address is that DevM um, IO wrap me remap resource is going to do the error checking that you need. So you don't actually need this code here to test whether the value is null or not. Okay, so what I'm going to do is explain how to get rid of this code. And also what we want to do is we want to take this call and move it down right next to the DevM IO remap resource so that they're right together and so we can see the relationship between them. Okay, so it looks a little bit trivial, but in general, removing this kind of error handling code, it's cluttered, it's error prone, and so it makes the um, driver simpler in every way. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to be able to make these changes automatically and reliably and fast, and we want to um, be able to make them everywhere in the kernel and not just in one or two places. So basically what we need to be able to do, we need to only be able to do two things. We need to be able to find the code that we want to change and we need to be able to make the changes. Okay, so you can say to yourself, grep, grep is good for finding things. You can grep for um, platform get resource maybe and then you'll find all the platform get resources. Or you can get grep for dev m io remap uh, resource and then you'll find all of them. Um, but the problem is you won't find the relationship between them. Platform get resource is used for many other things. You don't want to change all of them. On the other hand, dev m io remap resource, probably you want to change all of them, but actually many of them have been fixed already. So you don't want to fi find the ones that, um, where the problem has already been addressed. Uh, so, and of course, you can use sed to make changes, but again, sed doesn't understand anything about C. Um, it doesn't, for example, if you think back to the Boolean example, it doesn't know anything about whether the variable is a Boolean or not. Um, and so it doesn't have all the information that you want. Okay, so what we propose is a tool called Coxnl. Uh, the tool has existed for I don't know, eight years or so, so it sort of works a little bit. Um, people seem to use it. Um, it provides static analysis for finding patterns in C code, and then it provides automatic transformation. So basically, you describe what kind of code you're interested in finding, you annotate it with how you want it to be transformed, and then the tool takes your entire kernel or your entire code base, C code base in general, and finds the things you want to change and makes the transformations. Um, so the specifications, we call them semantic patches because the idea is that they should look like the patches that people are familiar with, um, but they're somehow more high level, they're more aware of, on the one hand, the syntax, so it knows what's a variable name, what's a function call, and so on. And the semantics, it knows what, how, um, it knows about types, it knows how things uh, flow, the control flow from one place to another of the C language. Uh, so I'll repeat these later, but just to point out, this is the, uh, you can download the tool. You can also get it from many Linux distributions. And we also have a large number of examples. There's no particular guarantee about the quality of these examples, but they're still available. And you can look through them and see if there's something that you would like to, um, similar to what you want to do. Okay, so we'll go back to our Boolean example. So this is the function we looked at before. We had two problems in this function. One of them is at the point where we declare the um, Boolean variable, we want to change the zero into a false. And one is at the point where we use the variable later, we want to change the one into a true. Okay, so we'll start with the first problem. The first case is easiest because we have the word bool sitting right there and we have the bad, bad value that we want to change. So in general, what we want to do is we want to change all occurrences of bool b equals zero into bool b equals false. And similarly, bool b equals one into bool b equals true. Okay, so that's something you might be able to do with sed. Although you might run into trouble if there is actually more than one variable being declared at a time. Okay, so the idea with Coxnell is um, 
basically just write down what is the old code you want and what is the new code you want and, and sort of merge them together. So basically, just what I have down here, we have bool b equals zero should turn into bool b equals false. Really the only change is that zero should turn into false. So we end up with this. Um, so the idea is it should look sort of like a patch. So a patch has the little at sign, at sign, at sign, at sign at the beginning. It has some line numbers in the middle of those things, and then it has some co a code fragment that comes afterwards. So in our case, we kept the at sign, at sign stuff, but in the middle, what we put are declarations of what we call meta variables. So meta variables are variables that stand for arbitrary terms that s fulfill some syntactic rule. So in this case, it's an identifier. We, the idea is here we have a bool. <coughs> bool is our type name, that's important. Uh, b is our variable name, the variable that's being declared, that's not important. We want, to, we want this rule to apply to any declaration of any Boolean variable. So b is going to be just an arbitrary identifier, and then it's an initialization. And then if we see a zero here, we want to remove it. So this looks sort of like a patch in that the things we want to remove have a little minus at the beginning and the things that we want to add have a plus at the beginning. We want to remove the zero, we want to turn it into a false. And then we have our semicolon at the end. So basically, it's similar to a patch in that it looks like code, and in that um, you annotate the things you want to remove, whatever they are, with minus, and the things you want to add, whatever they are, with plus. Um, on the other hand, if this was a patch, Patches are much more line oriented. So here, this specification, it's not sensitive to spaces or lines or comments or whatever. Um, so I could have also written minus bool b equals zero, semicolon plus bool b uh, equals false. So that would look a little bit more like a patch. Um, but there's no point to duplicate that information. Here, um, it's simpler just to specify the things that you want to change. Okay, so what we have here is two, there's two things we want to do, and so there are two rules. One of them is for taking care of the zero case, and one of them is for taking care of the one case. So then we take the specification, we can run this specification over the entire Linux kernel, and it will, and it will look in each file, and it, it will apply first this rule, and then this rule to each of the functions in the file, and make any changes that are appropriate. So in our case, we get this. This is the function that we had before. And we see that this got changed to that. OK, so we have done part of the problem. We haven't done the entire problem, because we still have this variable here being set to 1. And we preferred that it should be set to true. Yes, but still, it, we have updated 187 lines and 124 files. And so then, there were, ideally, there should not be any more um, Boolean declarations being assigned to either 0 or 1. OK, so then next we need to consider what we can do about this part. Because now we don't have the bool here telling us what to do. So we need to add some more information to the specification. Okay, so fortunately, Coxinel collects information about the types of all variables, and so that you can use that information in your specification. So Coxinel actually doesn't do very much actual static analysis. This is really the only thing that it's doing sort of under the hood, which is to find out the types. And so before we had a, a meta variable which was declared to be type identifier, now it's going to be declared to be a type bool. And so what that means is that Coxinel will go through your code, and it will look for any place where there's an expression where it has figured out that the type is bool. OK, so if you think about C code, maybe it's quite hard to type check. You need to have header files. Coxinel tries to avoid using header files, so it might miss something because it's not aware of the types. Um, but it does the best it can. You can tell it to include more and more header files. It will get more and more type information if you need it. Um, so what this says is whenever we have an assignment, where the left-hand side of the assignment is any term that has type bool, and the right-hand side of the assignment is a zero, 
Then we want to replace the zero by false. And then again, we have a second rule. If we ever have the left-hand side of the assignment is a, is a Boolean expression again, if the right-hand side is a one, then we want to replace it by true. Okay, so again, this is quite a simple, simple thing to write. And um, now, in this particular case, it solves the complete problem for us. We've changed the declaration, we've changed all of the uses as well. And this, uh, this time we touch 657 lines in 236 files of Linux 3.10. Yes? Okay, so the question is, um, do we know that this RV is the same as this RV? Um, so in our case, the way I wrote the rules, we had four rules, two for the type declaration case and two for the use case. And it makes no connection between them. The only thing it knows is that the type checker has figured out that RV, the type checker is going to, when it's doing its analysis, it will see that there's a bool RV up here. And um, so it will see that this is a Boolean variable. So it is, it is making the connection, but um, in terms of the transformation, matching and transformation process, there's no connection that we made a transformation up here and that we, we should then make another transformation down here. It's just using the type information. Okay? So does anyone want to object to what I've done so far? Okay, no, it's not really. <laughs> I don't know, it's like 50,000 lines of OCaml code, it's not magic, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's good you asked this question because I actually measured it on um, a four uh, core laptop. What kind is it? Okay, two cores with four, four threads, um, it takes about seven minutes. Uh, so what, one thing that Calcinel is doing is it sees that the word bool is very important. And so first it's going to s filter out all the files that include bool. And so maybe a lot of the files it won't be doing anything with at all. So that makes it more efficient. Yeah. Um, uh, I see what you mean. Um, yes, I'm, I mean, I'm sure you could, but it would be more complicated, so. I think, yeah, I think it should be possible. I mean, you can describe arbitrarily complicated things, but the descriptions obviously get more complicated as well. So it might be a trade-off. If you think this pattern is common, and it might actually be common, because um, there are many little functions that have to search for things, then it might be worth your while. Um, another thing that could be worth your while Maybe it's a bit hard to specify the transformation because what you would have to do is somehow collect all of the information that's down here and move it up in here. And decide. you would also have to decide whether that's worthwhile or not. If there's 500 lines, maybe you don't want to duplicate that. Um, so another thing you can do is you can search for this pattern. Maybe you're going to find five instances of it and maybe you'd be just as well to um, do the transformation by hand afterwards. But finding the five instances out of the 18 million lines of kernel code or whatever is, is also useful. OK, so no one has objected yet? Yeah? Can I write on this? Oh, is there any official person here? 
Is there any writing device here? No. Okay. Um, okay. So. Uh, I don't know. It's too clever. Um, okay, so I actually wrote this in a very subtle and clever way that I didn't explain to you um, here. Um, the fact that I am only making the change in a very isolated place on the right-hand side allows it to match the kinds of things that you talked about. Um, so. On the other hand, if I had written what I sort of wrote here in the beginning in an informal manner, if I had written it like this, replace bool b equals zero semicolon by something else, so if I put a minus in front of that and a plus in front of that, then it would only be able to deal with the case that looks exactly like this one. Oh. But when you make very localized changes in variable declarations, it it will actually sort of map this specification onto all of the possible declarations. So if you have bool b equals zero, comma a, comma b, or comma x, comma y equals one, then it will change the zero to false and the one to true, and it will not be perturbed by the other variables. Okay, so the objection that I thought somebody might, oh, yes. 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 Okay. Um, so, someone in the audience is destroying the pedagogical <laughs> um, direction of my talk. Um, but actually, if I had only made this specification, it would realize when you say bool b equals zero that b is going to have type boolean also. And actually, this rule is enough to do everything. On the other hand, when I showed these numbers down here, the 657 lines, 2 and 36 files, I made sure that it was only the cases where they were these assignments. I'm not including the things that were done already by the other rule. So if you have rules that overlap in this way, if you put, the, if you put this rule first, then this rule would apply first and then the second rules wouldn't apply there because there's not any zeros and ones anymore here. Um, but actually it is true that um, it's aware of the, the type that this variable is going to have and it's able to make the change. Yes? Uh, so you mean RV arrow A equals one, is that what you mean? Yeah, it's no problem. It, uh, the type, uh, I mean, it's up to the ability of the type inference to figure out what the type is. Um, so it needs to have access to the definition of the structure. And if the definition of the structure is in the same file, then that's fine. If it's in a header file, then you have to be sure that it's the header file is being taken into account. Yeah, so I'm not sure if that actually works as perfectly as you would like. Um, it might actually be necessary to uh, get rid of the optimization in this case. But I, I mean, we should fix that. It should, it should work better somehow. Any more questions? So the objection that one could have made is that actually we haven't really addressed all of the ways that Boolean values can be used. Um, a Boolean, you can pass a 1 or a 0 to a function, and the function might have a Boolean parameter. Uh, you might have just return 1, return 0, it's quite common, and the result has type Boolean. Um, and so then there's ways, there's ways you can make rules for these things. And then there's a whole other set of problems, sort of the opposite problem, which is where you have a true or a false, and it's used with a variable of type int or u32 or whatever. Um, and so that's a whole other set of things that um, 
Actually, Peter, who's sitting over there in the corner, has um, worked a little bit on fixing. So it's beyond the scope of the talk. If you need to do something like that, you can talk with me and I can show you an example of how to do it. Okay, so our second example is the case where we have this function, platform get resource. We have another function, dev m io remap resource. Uh, these two function calls are quite far away from each other. In this case, they're maybe 40, 50 line, 45 lines away from each other. Um, the result of this call is only used down here, and this function here is going to do the error checking that's needed on the resulting value. So we would really like to get rid of these, get rid of these lines. Okay, so this case is a bit more complicated because, um, as, as I mentioned before, it's not it's not sufficient to just look for this function call, or it's not sufficient just to look for this one. We have to look for them somehow both at the same time. So it's different than the Boolean case. In the Boolean case, we could just look at one, look for one atomic piece of code. Yeah, and so they can be separated by arbitrary code fragments. We can have lots of lines in between, and the, the number of lines and the amount of lines can be completely different from one usage context to another. Okay, so we'll make a, a rule that addresses this case. Um, so this time I'm going to make the rule in a bit more incremental manner because it's a bit more complicated. Uh, so the idea is ideally what you should be able to do is find some typical code that, uh, that illustrates your problem and start with that code and then abstract it in different ways until you get a, a general specification that can be applied everywhere in the kernel. So here I have taken from the first line of interest in the code we saw before to the last line of interest, and then we'll see what to do about the rest here. Okay, so the first point is to get rid of lots of the code. We are actually only interested in this part, this part, and this part, so all the stuff in between, it can just go away. Okay, so we have the part we're interested in at the beginning, and then we have this dot, dot, dot. So actually, before, because my example is too big to fit on the screen, I had a dot, dot, dot as well. But the dot, dot, dot I had before was just, this comes syntactically on a sheet of paper before this one. This dot, dot, dot here has a real actual meaning. This means, this one means that if you start executing up here, then you will eventually, your execution will eventually come down here. So it's, it's saying how these two things are connected to each other. Okay, so we dropped the irrelevant parts. Now we have, um, I mean, actually some of this code here that's left over is not so relevant either. Uh, in terms of our actual uh, transformation, we don't really care what is in this error handling code, what message is being printed, and so on. Um, we don't care what the different variables are called, and, and so on. So we won't need to abstract over those things as well. So now we can introduce our meta variables. Basically, we introduce meta variables for the things we don't care about. We don't care about what is the name of this variable. We don't care about the name of this variable. We don't care about this value. On the other hand, this value is very important. This value is a flag, which is saying what kind of resource we're trying to get. So sort of as a sanity check, we would like to be sure that this flag has this value, because that somehow makes, is, is ensures that everything fits together in the right way. Um, so we also didn't care about what's the context, contents of this error handling code. Uh, we just want to uh, get rid of it. So this abstracts over lots of things, but it also expresses relationships between things. We see that the result of platform get resource has to be the thing that's checked here, and it has to be the same value, which is the uh, second argument to dev m io remap. Um, because the whole idea here is that this function is going to do this test, and so we don't need to perform this test up here. Okay, so now we have a suitably abstract specification of code that we're interested in, so we need to describe how, what kinds of changes we want to make. And basically we want to do, there's two changes we want to make. We want to take this code and move it down here, and we want to just remove this error handling code, which has become redundant. 
So basically, I remove this entire line, and then I move it down here with a plus in front of it, and then I remove this. So this is going to remove the if, it's going to remove the test, and then it's going to remove all of the stuff which is in the branch that comes afterwards, which is matching this meta variable, which is said to be a statement. Okay, so this is the entire specification, then we could apply it to the Linux kernel and it would make the transformation everywhere. Yes? How do you make sure that uh, the name is not used in, uh, uh, in the block, uh, by Yeah, okay, so this time I didn't even have to ask you if you wanted to object, you just objected mm -hmm. immediately. Um, so as, as was pointed out, this dot dot dot, this dot 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 is anything at all. And so there might be uses of mem in this region of code, or there might be re redefinitions of mem. Mem could be something completely different. This could be 500 lines of code here. We have no idea what's going on. Um, so what you can do is you can say, you can modify dot 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 with various things. Here I'm only doing one thing, but you can have lots of these when clauses afterwards. And we can say when there's no reference to mem at all. You could also have said when there's no assignment to mem, when mem is not equal to some arbitrary thing E1, or you can put anything you want, any kind of term you want, you can fit in here. Um, and so this will ensure that since there's no reference to mem whatsoever, um, and mem is a local variable, there's no aliases to it, um, that the value up here is the same as the value down here. Okay, so in this particular, yeah. Maybe, actually, maybe I'll say one more thing and then okay. answer your question. In this particular case, if when we add this, we, if we don't have this, we get 55 changes, changes in 55 files. And when we add this, we get only changes in 42 files. Okay, so even though leaving this out is, is incorrect, you might want to try leaving it out and study up on the results and see if there is um, some, something, maybe a more precise transformation to present or um, just ch changes you can make manually. Because what happens in practice is that people take this mem value and then they say start equals mem arrow start or size equals resource size mem. Okay, these things are just, they're just very small computations and naming things, it's not very important. Um, you would really rather do this transformation and reorganize things in, in, in a slightly different way. Um, so the idea here is that since you're writing the specification by yourself, you have absolute control over what code is matched, what happens in between one place and another. Then you can also adjust the specification and study the results, see if you get more false positives, fewer or false, false positives and um, try to understand the code in different ways. So it's sort of an interactive process where you write a specification, you find things, you change things, you adjust the specification to do more or less and so on. Yeah. Uh, what if uh, mem is null? So sorry, mem is what? Null, null Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't understand the question. Uh, you're moving the um, assignment to mem mm -hmm. uh, before it's used. But what if, if I don't get mem assigned, uh, I, I don't want to execute the um, code in between? I see. OK. Um, if, if I, I understand, of course. Um, so the idea here, okay, we, ha we, are we are ensured that there's no mem reference to mem, but maybe the fact that this has failed has implied something extremely bad about the rest of the system, and we should not be doing all the k malix and k whatever other strange things are going on in here. Okay, so if that's the case, then obviously this is not the right transformation for you. That's all I can say. Um, you, you write this transformation because you know that platform get resource is, is just a, it's just a thing that goes and looks up in a table and gets some information. Um, so it doesn't really imply anything about the state of the system, except that this particular resource is known or not known. Um, uh, 
yeah. It's, it's just the, in your, in your, if, I mean, it, there's certainly other cases where you don't want to move things around in this violent manner. And um, in that case, having, giving this function, devm io vmap resource, this uh, extra power, which is that it checks the validity of the argument, is probably not a useful thing. For, I mean, it's sort of a better design maybe also. Yeah, no, I agree completely. Um, it, it's certainly changing the semantics. I have written the rule. I'm taking responsibility for the fact that it changes the semantics. If you, um, if for some reason you wanted to be sure that actually all of this code would be executed in either way, then you wouldn't have just S here. S is just some random statement. You could say open brace dot 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 when not equals return. Um, or when not equal go to, you'd probably want to check for that as well. And then you would be sure that it's, it's um, I mean, you, you can put various when clauses in there to be sure, th give yourself the amount of safety that you want. You could also, you on this when here, maybe there is some special operation, foo, and when this fails, you should never do foo. Everything else would be okay, but foo is not good. In that case, you can also put, there's when no foo calls to foo in here. So. You, you express what you want to express. The tool is not going to do anything for you. Um, you say what you need. Okay. Any other more questions? Yeah. Uh, why not move the second statement up next to the get resource? Uh, maybe with the following if, uh, if check. Yeah, sure, sure. That's another option. Um, so. It's just, I have the impression that this is a very trivial operation, and this is a much more se serious operation, and so it seems easier to move this one down. But it's no problem. If you want to move this one up, that'd be fine. And as you point out, this one is also has the possibility to fail. It could have an if test afterwards, and you could take the whole thing and move it up here. No problem. Any more questions? Yes? Okay, so that's a good question. So, um, this platform get resource, when it, things don't work out, it returns null. Um, so, there are three ways you can test for returning null. You can say exclamation point mem, you can say mem equals null, and you can say null equals mem. And um, it would be quite tiresome, you could certainly do it, but it's quite tiresome to have to write them all out by yourself. Uh, so Coxenel knows, has some idea of what's called isomorphisms, which are user-specified equivalences, so there's some that are built in, and it has them all. Uh, actually, I think if I had put mem equals equals null, then it would consider all three cases. I think actually, it's not so good here, Ex exclamation point mem maybe doesn't consider as many cases as one would want. And the reason is because it's ambiguous. If you don't have any type information, you don't know whether you want to be comparing to null or comparing to zero. Um, so it could be improved in that way. Any other questions? Okay, so as I said, this affects, uh, the way it's written here, it affects uh, 42 files and Linux 3.10. Okay, but there's still um, another improvement that we could make. <laughs> So our rule was a bit specific here. Uh, yes, our rule here was a bit specific. Okay, the, the really important point here is that we have a, val a return value here, and that return value is getting used here, and where it's going to be tested, and so we don't need to test it back there. But I specified some other things. In particular, I specified we have this thing here called PDEV, and I specify that the first argument to dev m io map resource is the same pdev that we used back up here. Okay, so the code somehow wouldn't make sense if these things weren't related to each other in, in that way. But if we trust the original developer, then we don't really need to make that constraint. So th again, there's, there, there's different th levels of security that you can give yourself. You can make this specification because you can say this is the only thing that makes sense. Or you can say I don't really care. You could just put dot, dot, dot here and say, let it be anything. Um, but we made this choice to do that. 
So it turns out that a few times that doesn't work out. Um, sometimes people like to name pdev, error dev, give it some other name, and then when they need to use pdev, error dev, they use that name, and when they use, need to use pdev, they just use pdev as it is. So now we don't see the relationship between these two calls anymore. Okay, so I suggested one way to avoid this problem is just to not specify anything about things that we actually don't care about. Another way, which is a bit, to be a bit more conservative, is to specify rules for each of the cases that we do discover that we care about. So we found we care about this case, where um, x equals pdev, there's the initialization of x to pdev up here, and then sometimes we use pdev, and sometimes we use x. And so notice here, actually this goes back to a question that was asked previously, here I just have something that looks like an assignment, but this will actually also match the case where the assignment is in a variable initialization. So it catches the case that we saw before. And this updates four more files in Linux 3.10. Okay, so in summary, what we have seen the need for is a way of um, basically searching for different code patterns and making transformations in them. Uh, so the very simple case is we just want to look for an atomic thing where we have all of the information available in the syntax. Uh, so we saw that with the declaration and initialization of Boolean values. In a slightly more complicated case, we need some extra information, so we have the type information. Um, so some people also actually have commented that the type information makes Cox now quite useful as a sort of super grep, where you want to grep for maybe you have a field in a structure, you want to see where that type of field is called or initialized and so on. Um, grep won't help you because you don't know the name of the structure at the point that, where that happens, but if you have the type information, then, that, then you focus in on the right thing. Um, and then in a more complicated case, we have scattered code fragments. It might be one, two, three different pieces of code. They should be related to each other in some way in terms of execution. In a more complicated case, they're in different functions or different declarations. Um, in our particular case, we had platform get resource somewhere followed by devm io remap. So in general, you can write your, down your different code fragments, express how they're related to each other with dot, dot, dots, with meta variables and so on, and then the, you get the pattern that you're looking for. And then the last refinement we saw was taking variable renamings into account. So in conclusion, um, Coxnell is a tool for defining and performing arbitrary transformations across a code base. Um, gives maybe reasonable performance in most cases. So if you ask about performance, it's a very hard question to answer because if you are, I mean, the Linux kernel is huge, but if you're interested in transforming a function that's only used 10 times, it will be extremely fast because it will only find those 10 files that use that function and it will only work on those files. If you make a rule that has to do with only integers and nulls and ifs and whiles, and if those things are deeply nested in loops and nested conditionals and so on, um, first, there's nothing specific about initial integers and nulls and loops and whiles, so we have to consider all of the files, so we have to parse all the files. And also, it's, since it's following control flow paths, when they're loops, it has to go around them, and when there are ifs, it has to go through the different branches, so that can get to be more expensive. Um, buy a bigger machine, that's my best suggestion. Um, so we have over a thousand patches that have been based on the use of Coxnell, which have been integrated into Linux. Actually, I haven't counted recently, so I don't really know how many there are. And there's also a number of examples which are included in the Linux kernel source tree. So many of them are Linux specific, but some of them are quite generic. If you have a null pointer, if you test for something being null and then you have a dereference of it, that's not going to be good. Um, as I mentioned before, we have this gallery of semantic patches, so you can think to yourself that the ones in Linux are somehow of good quality. You might want to use, if you can find them useful for other projects, it will probably be useful. The ones that are here are maybe a bit more, um, uh, maybe less well-maintained, but they can serve as examples of things you might want to do in other situations. And you can download the software here. There's um, a small amount of documentation and so on. We have a mailing list, you can send email, we try to respond quickly. Any more questions? Uh, 
Um, I was wondering if it's possible to use only the searching capability and not the replacing capabilities of Coccinel. Yes, like okay. Um, so if you, so there's two ways to use the searching capabilities. One of them is, um, uh, so we saw in the examples when you want to change something, you put a minus in front of the things you want to remove and plus in front of the things you want to add. When you just want to search for something, you can just put a star in that position. And what it gives you is a pat something that looks like a patch in which there are minuses in the, on the lines that were of interest. Okay, so it doesn't highlight the specific thing of interest, it just highlights the line. And at least in Emacs, if you use that thing, then you can jump to the right place in the code um, with, the, with that particular um, patch-like specification. So that's one option. Another option is that you can mark the positions of things. There's a way of, of marking any kind of position, a parenthesis of an expression, of a statement, anything at all. Um, and then you can use that pos those positions in um, code that's written in either Python or OCaml. And then you can print out a nice message that says there's a problem on line 47 in file, whatever, um, and so on. Uh, does Coxinel directly works on kernel code or does it work on pre-processed code? Directly on kernel code. Okay, so uh, how do you manage to, don't, don't you need to expand macros at some point? So macros, um, we just try to m work around them. Part of the reason is, uh, there's several reasons. One of them is that you might like to specify things in terms of macros. And so if, for if just a quite simple example, are they like hash defined constants? If they're all going to turn into 347 or zero or something like that, you're not going to be able to match against specific constants. Um, so many macros, at least Linux code, it's kind of well written. Many of yeah. them look like identifiers or they look like function calls. And so we just parse them as that and you can reason about them as they are. Uh, sometimes there are things like if defs and the if defs, you might have an if def that has two alternatives for an if header. Something like that is kind of difficult to parse. Um, if we have if defs and if we can turn them into normal ifs, then we try to do that so that you won't think there's the, so it won't think that there's a fall through from one branch to the other branch. Um, if it can't do that, it just tries to do something. It takes the first branch only, perhaps, um, and so on. In general, you 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 can also specify so give some sort of dummy definitions of macros. And so, if there's some macros that you use all the time that somehow don't mean any, aren't very relevant for the thing that you want to, um, to, your, to the rules you're interested in writing. You can give a dummy definition, the Mac will just, will just disappear and then um, things will work well. Um, in general, it parses one function at a time or one top level declaration at a time. And if macros cause it not to be able to parse some of the declarations, it just skips over it and moves on to the next one. So um, if you're lucky, the code that you're interested in transforming is in the part of the code that you can parse and not in the part of the code you can't parse. So that's perhaps a naive way of looking th at things, but many times strange macros are used in very specific situations and your actual functions are written in a reasonable way, at least in the case of Linux code. Um, so it's, it's okay, they, it can give you some, if you give a flag, it will give you some feedback about what it was not able to parse. Um, it's certainly the case that sometimes you expected a certain transformation to occur in certain functions and you find that it doesn't and then you see, okay, it didn't parse and then you have to go um, try to do something about that. Uh, you got... Uh 1,000 patches into the Linux base. Do you have some semantic patches included upstream? So, yeah, so, it's, so it sounds the your work is pretty efficient. Is there any um, work in the progress to put Coxnell as a hook on the Git of kernel? Because if your rules are matching and prevent many mistakes, why not making it, making it uh, mandatory for any commits? Yeah, so um, there's people in uh, Intel in China who do this. They, um, not just Cox and all, they, they have a bunch of tools and they run them every day on everything that people have committed. And um, they send out messages to people telling them, uh, 
actually Coxinel doesn't work properly on or finds an error on this particular code, maybe you should change it. So, so it's not at the level of the individual developer when he tries to commit, but it's still happening very shortly after the commit happens, and so it seems like a good compromise. Um, these rules, um, even the ones that are in here, some of them are high confidence, some of them are low confidence, and so on. So um, sometimes it's valuable to have a rule to make it available to everyone, but it might be a low confidence rule, and so many people might be bothered if they had to deal with it on every commit. So it's sort of a trade-off. There's a question. Uh, I would like to come back with uh, on the example of Boolean. Uh, in, in these examples, uh, you define a variable and you use th this variable by his name. But in other case, for example, uh, suppose that the Boolean is in a structure. And uh, with a mem copy, for example, you uh, put all zeros on uh, the structure. Uh, do you think that Coxinel is able to see that uh, this Boolean, enfin, when the, you put the mem copy, you, you put the Boolean to false? No. Oh. It's, I'm not even sure that's a good idea. I mean, the mem copy. It's nice, efficient operation. It just does. It's very okay. concise. So it'd be annoying to break the mem copy just to f fill in one field with a value that has the right Thank letters you. in it. <coughs> There's a question back there also. Um, there is something uh, which I find uh, really nice with the language uh, which is used to define the semantic patches, which is that it is uh, uh, small, compact, and very readable. And I have seen a lot of patches going into the kernel where the commit message was only uh, this bug was found with the following uh, uh, rule and uh, fixed with the semantic patch. And uh, it's interesting because uh, uh, this way, uh, people can learn the language and the, the, the good practice uh, to apply to their code uh, mm -hmm. just by reading their uh, commit messages. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, the last question. Um, thank you for this uh, very interesting presentation. I have one question regarding other language. Uh, because I understand that this tool is working mainly with uh, plain C, and uh, is it possible to use it with uh, other language? And if not, wh what would be the effort to, to port the tool? For example, working with C++ or Python, or I don't know. Okay. Uh, so we have made a small effort to make it work with C++. It sort of goes back to the question I, that I was asked about macros. Uh, so some parts of C++ code looks just like C code, and some parts of it looks completely different. And so... Currently, our parser, the stuff that's completely different, it doesn't parse, and so it just it gets ignored. And the actual methods where you might want to actually de do some kinds of transformations, we've added in a few C++ keywords like new and delete and so on, and so it's able to sort of parse those kinds of things, and you can do transformations inside there. Um, but that's kind of a hack. I mean, it's not really treating C++. It's just making the C++, and it's taking advantage of the fact that C++ syntax looks like C syntax, parsing it with a C parser. Um, so it's about, I don't know, 50,000, 70,000 lines of OCaml code. And all of the code is, um, you have an abstract syntax tree, which is quite specific to C. And all of the code is just traversing over and over over those abstract syntax trees. And so all of the code is very specific to, I mean, at the high level, there's nothing that's specific to C as compared to, say, Java or Python or anything like that. But in the implementation, everything is specific to our particular abstract syntax tree. Yes. Uh, this, uh, was, sorry? Just a quickie. Okay. About Quick. Thank you. What about using the GCC plugin infrastructure to get a, a more complete representation of the program and use that to do the transformation from Quixinet? Okay, uh, so I haven't looked into GCC very recently. In the past, it was the case that it could change, the representation could change at any random moment. And um, I know of other tools that were built based on GCC, and then those tools just died off after a year or so because everything changed in GCC and um, they couldn't keep up. So that's why we wanted to 
make our own representation, which would have exactly the information that we need. In particular, we want to, we're doing um, code generation at the source level, and so we expect, we want the code to look just like it did before. We need all the comments, all the white space, and we need to manage that in some way. So we preferred to do our own tools. Okay, thank you.